Hi everyone, my name is Christian Eschbach, and I am so happy to be breaking my normal rules of covering Alice once every 20 albums. I've got it in my hands finally. If you're one of my regular viewers, you heard the whining and the complaining and the bitching. I got it in my hands, and I have listened to it, and I have listened to it, and I have listened to it, and I have listened to it. And the next statement I'm going to make, I don't make lightly. This is the best album Alice Cooper has released. Under the title of Alice Cooper, this is not including the Hollywood Vampires. This is the best album Alice Cooper has released since Hey Stupid. I will say that 100% for sure, without a doubt. There have been many, many fantastic albums since Hey Stupid. Along Came a Spider is one of my personal favorites. Brutal Planet's another one that's absolutely magnificent. And I haven't done a review for Hey Stupid yet, so you don't know what my views on that one are either. But this is definitely the best album I have heard since Hey Stupid. Like, the most wow album Alice has released. But I am willing to go further than that and to say this is possibly the best album since Billion Dollar Babies. I love Welcome to My Nightmare. I absolutely adore Welcome to My Nightmare, but I am telling you right now, I will listen to this album more than I will listen to Welcome to My Nightmare. There are more songs on this album I would cover than there are Welcome to My Nightmare, and I've covered a few songs from Welcome to My Nightmare. So, <laughs> um, wow, okay, that's, for starters, wow, wow, just, Alice Cooper's first album, if you go, you go Wikipedia this crap, okay, this is Alice Cooper's first album to enter number one on Billboard album sales charts. First album! Album number 28 of studio albums, okay? 28 studio albums. The man is in his 70s now, still performs amazingly. First album to hit number one in the Billboard album charts. And you know who knocked him off? Rob fucking Zombie. I mean, he might have been knocked off by someone before Rob Zombie, but Rob Zombie's now number one in that position. So, I want you to think about that, okay? Okay, so that is my whole argument right there going forward on this album. Before we even get started, you already know what my opinion is. So, I want to start with, this is not all original music. There are covers on this album, so that is one of the things that does help this album. But, but, yeah, the, the covers all make sense. Every last one he does on here. And some are a little surprising. And it also makes sense why he would not do them with the Hollywood Vampires. He would do them as Alice Cooper. Detroit Stories. Okay, so let's start with... The, there, there are a plethora of musicians on this album, okay? But there are core musicians. So obviously, you got Alice Cooper, okay? Alice Cooper is, you know, the vocals the whole way through. You know, there's additional vocals on there. But Alice is vocals the whole way through. Then you've got Johnny B. Ben. Bad. Bad. Badanyuk. Badanyuk. I'm thinking that's Badanyuk. I'm going to put it up here. All right. Drums. Pretty much the entire album. Paul Randolph. Bass. Pretty much the entire album. Legendary MC5 guitarist Wayne Kramer, almost the entire album. Tommy Henriksen, who has been with Alice both in the Hollywood Vampires and doing albums and touring. I've I've met Tommy, he's a great guy. Really funny dude. Um Entire album. He also is a major co-writer on here, too. Most of the other musicians, they just appear. Tommy Hendrickson is actually a writer on quite a few of these songs, and I'll get into that as we go as well. Um, and then Bob Ezrin appears as a musician throughout the album. Sometimes piano, sometimes organ, various different things. 
Uh, and then there's also, you know, like I said, there's a slew of other people, and it varies because sometimes, you know, if Dennis Dunaway shows up on a song, and there are, oh, uh, you're Dennis Dunaway and Neil Smith, okay? Both of them not only have writing credits, they have playing credits on here, and they have it where it matters. Oh my lord, I'm gonna blow your friggin' minds when we start getting into this, baby, okay? So let's just get into this album. First off, this album just throws you right into it. There is no lead up, there is no warm up, there is no, you know, like you could say there's always some type of lead in on an Alice Cooper album, something to set the mood if you want. Not this one, it's just bada boom, kicks right in with Lou Reed's rock and roll, baby. And not only does it kick in with Lou Reed's rock and roll, Alice goes one step further and he gets one of the original guitarists from Lou Reed's version of it. He gets Steve Hunter, one of Alice Cooper's guitarists, to come out and play on this. And oh my God, holy shit, does it light up this album. I mean, you are just in the album right away. There is no warm up, no, no, boom, you are there. You are rocking this album. has got your pants on fire, baby. Holy shit. Seriously. Just throw it into the mix of it. Oh, and it is beautiful. And it is that Detroit sound right away. You know this is Detroit rock and roll, baby. You can hear the Motown on the, in there. You can hear the Detroit garage rock in there. You can hear it all. Oh, it is just so much flavor for the palate. Bob Ezrin, as the producer on this album, does it beautifully. Oh, I sound ridiculous. That is how awesome this is, okay? Holy shit. Magic. Magic. Just pure, unadulterated magic. And Alice's vocals. I mean, one thing I'm going to say right now, uh, one of my all-time favorite movies, thanks to uh, my uncle, is called The Commitments. It's about a soul band. Uh, Dublin soul. But, you know, they're doing old soul stuff. And... This album sounds like it's part of that time period. You know, it's got that soul sound to it, man. There's a lot of James Brown-like vibes in here. Uh, you know, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones. But you can hear that vibe. You can hear those essences, man. You hear them when they get kicking in. It. It's just, whoa. Okay, now, that goes from killer start to the album to probably what I consider the weakest song on the album. Uh, Go Mango. It's not a bad tune. It's a great garage kind of Detroit sound. You know, it's got that punk vibe. Uh, Wayne Kramer is actually a co-writer on this. This one's Alice Cooper, Tommy, Wayne Kramer, and Bob, e Bob Ezrin. They nail it. They nail that classic Detroit sound from that day. You know, this is very got kind of MC5, MC5, Iggy and the Stooges. I'm actually kind of surprised there is no Stooges on here a little bit, actually. Alice, little upset. There should have been a little Iggy on here, some Stooges, but it's okay. It's okay. I love to hear Alice do I Want to Be Your Dog. Oh my God. I so want to hear Alice do I Want to Be Your Dog. That would be great. Uh, should have been on here. <laughs> B-Side Alice. Bonus track later on, maybe. Who knows? Okay. Um, but anyways, Go Man Go is the only one on here. I'm a little eh on about... Uh, I find most people would probably skip it. If you're into that kind of punk vibe, that in-your-face kind of vibe, great tune. It really is. I mean, I could definitely see a whole new generation of punk, guitar punk guitarists or a whole new generation of... Uh, garage musicians wanted to do that song. It's a fun tune. Uh, after that, we go into Our Love Will Change the World. Now, this is an old Outrageous Cherry song. I don't know Outrageous Cherry that well. Right away when I hear this song, I think the Partridge Family or I think uh, something fun and light and playful because the way it sounds. Um, and the song is called I, I'm sure I've already mentioned this, our level changed the world. Now, the co-writers on this are Matt Smith, who is from Outrageous Cherry, and then you've got uh, Alice Cooper and Bob Ezra. Uh, now, that's because there's definitely was some lyrical changes in here. They definitely did some inflections to make the song a little more Alice. 
it's very much a 60 hippies love fest our love will change the world and to hear alice do this that this is what shock rock has become folks that alice has to do hippie songs okay the guy who claims that he drove the heart the stake through the heart of the love generation is now resorting to doing songs from the love generation to shock the world <laughs> because yeah alice has to spread love now to change the world okay that's how bad it's gotten okay uh And I love the way that this is worded because I almost want to say that this this song is a giant shot at cancel cancel culture. It really is, you know, because right off the bat, we have very little respect for everything. We very little regard for anything. We've got something against so much. Much we've got something against so much, and we're only beginning. Cancel, cancel cancer yeah it is basically cancel culture in a nutshell with the way it's going and and it is and it's it's absolutely but this song is so much fun i love singing this song oh my god it is so great and just listening to alice rip on the state of the world with the most hippie peace loving like i said the partridge family like song is just great it is. It is such beautiful tongue-in-cheek humor, and I love that Alice does it so well all the time. All right, now we get on to what would be Alice's... Now, Our Love Will Change the World has been released as a video. I should mention before I move on. Go watch the video. It is so hilarious and so cute and so funny and the animation is done in a way that if you're familiar with an old cartoon called old meaning a 90s cartoon called angela anaconda it's done in a similar method it's so cute and hilarious so anyways uh moving on to social debris which was like the big rollout kind of single for this album um at least as far as i know now to me, this is badass cool that this is a big rollout single because this song was written by Alice Cooper, Neil Smith, and Bob Ezrin. Neil Smith being the original Alice Cooper drummer, who is by far one of my biggest drumming influences of all time. There is no other drummer I've listened to or studied as much. I love... Neil Peart, I am a Canadian, Neil Peart is God, but Neil Smith was my education, was my learning. Whew. Dude can just, most underrated drummer of all time. But the dude is a musical composer as well. He does write, he has always been a major contributor to the original group and a lot of the original music. So for him to be on the big rollout single social debris hell yeah baby and not just that dennis dunaway comes in on uh guitars but they go one step further they put michael bruce back in here on guitar too baby that's right that is michael bruce of the original group as well now he might not have the writing credits and there are a shit ton of guitars on here okay there's four separate guitarists on this song but the fact that you've got Dennis Dunaway as the only bassist, Neil Smith as the only drummer, and then you get Michael Bruce in there as well. So as I was saying, you, you can tell it's Michael Bruce when Michael Bruce is playing. You can tell it's the original man. There are certain little key notes or, or fills. Like, there's this great little fill that uh, Dennis Dunaway does on the bass right at the beginning. And you recognize it right off the bat because it's the opening bass riff for Elected. That, but do 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 do. And it, it just, but it's not that they're running off of Elected. It's just that little note to say, hey, baby, it's Dennis Dunaway on bass. You know, and then when you hear the drums, there's no doubting that it's Neil Smith on drums. And, and then you get to the, the gu guitar, like I said, especially when you get into the solos. When you get into the guitar solos, you can totally, beyond a shadow of a doubt, tell that it is Michael Bruce playing on there, man, without a second. And this song is just so original Alice Cooper group. And when I say original Alice Cooper group, I'm talking like Social Debris probably sounds like it belongs off of the um, 
School's Out album. It really does. Like, there are a lot of elements in here that are very much... It totally belongs on the School's Out album. And I just... ah. Oh. Soak it up, you know, like it's that good. It really is. All right. Now, the ones I'm going to move on from there and I'm going to get into the one song on this album that I just dig on. And this song has so much soul and it sounds, you heard me mention that thing about the commitments earlier. If you get a chance, if you've never seen the commitments, go watch it. After you've watched the commitments, go back, re-listen to this album and you're going to listen to Thousand Dollar High Heel Shoes. And you're going to be like, yep, I get exactly what he's talking about. They're $1,000 high heel shoes, man. Okay, so Alice, Wayne Kramer, and Bob Ezrin. This song sounds like it would have been done by one of the big names in Motown or, or, or Soul or Blues or, you know, that whole group intermixed into there, man. Like, there is just such a vibe on this song where, you know, you, I'm going to be a little racist here where you, you swear that, you know, it's a bunch of white guys covering some hardcore black dude stuff. Really, it's got that kind of vibe and feel to it. And it isn't, man. These are guys that are just Detroit guys. They get it. They grew up in Detroit, man. If you grew, And that was the problem is, you know, there, there used to be such a division in Detroit. You know, um, there's, uh, I believe the name of the band was Death. Uh, punk band, a black punk band out of Detroit, uh, late 60s, early 70s. Sound very much Stooges-like. Really killer. A little later than the Stooges, though. Really, really killer sounding. Um, and they didn't get discovered until, like, forever later. And it was because they were a black punk band, you know? And there was that division, you know, black guys did Motown, white guys did rock and roll. And I'm so glad that division has dropped because what you hear on a song like Thousand Dollar High Heel Shoes, man... It is so sexy. Now, to your average listener, there's definitely a misogynistic kind of vibe to the chorus. Uh, she slides in cool and tall. She don't wear no clothes at all. She dances to her own kind of rhythm and blues and a tiny dog collar and her thousand dollar high heel shoes. If you have ever dated a woman that wears thousand dollar high heel shoes, you know the song is not misogynistic. You know the pain that they're talking about in this song. And the whole song is having fun. It really is. It's it's a dude slaving and, and, and you know, having to lose his entire paycheck to this woman or thousand dollar high heel shoes, but it's all worth it the second she walks in there, man. Oh. Next song we get to. Hail Mary. This is Alice, Tommy Hendrickson, and Bob Ezrin. Hail Mary is just a good, fun song. It really is. Um, it's woman worship. It really is. It's woman worship Detroit style, man. It's like, baby, Mary, I love you. Come here, you know? And yeah, it's got a million religious inflections in there to go with it. Hail Mary, why not? You're going to have that fun with it, man. It is rock and fucking roll, baby. Rock and roll. Okay, sorry. <laughs> All right, moving on from there. We got Detroit City 2021. Now, Detroit City was originally released on Alice Cooper's Eyes of Alice Cooper. And that was the last time Alice Cooper took a shot at trying to capture that Detroit garage sound. Because at that time, he really loved what was coming out with the white stripes and stuff like that, which was really coming out with that more DIY, independent music. So Alice tried doing it back then, did not hit like it does here with Detroit City or Detroit Stories. Oh my God. Uh, now, Detroit City on here is. Tommy Hendrickson, Ryan Roxy, Chuck Garrick, and Bob Ezrin. These are basically all the guys that were responsible for writing and recording the original version. I would have to re-double check with the Tommy Hendrickson. I can't remember if Tommy was on the original because I know it was Eric Dover that played on the album for that one. So, 
Um, great tune. It really is. It's a really, really great tune. Um, the, they changed this one. Uh, the chorus is where the, the chorus is completely different in here. They don't, uh, do it the same as the other one. They've adapted it. Uh, the lyrics have been changed out a little bit. I really do enjoy this one. Uh, it is nice compared to the other one. You know, Alice has done versions before where he's, you know, re-released alternate lyrics. Um, Devil's Food, for example, uh, there, there was a special, a TV special that was done. If you can ever see it, good luck. Uh, where Devil's Food has a completely alternate set of lyrics. I actually like doing that version live on stage. I've performed the alternate version live on stage. It's great. Um, he's done, I've mentioned in the Special Forces review where he, did, he redid Generation Landslide, he threw an extra verse on it. This is not the same as that. This one, he's actually augmented the song. Like I said, the chorus has been changed out a bit and not just lyrically, but musically has been changed out too. Uh, it doesn't have as much of a soft kind of hooky vibe as it did in the original version, which is kind of cool. I really dig this one. It's it's a great update, and I think he captured the Detroit sound a lot more on this one than he did on the original version. Uh, going in there, we go into Drunk in Love. This is Alice Cooper, Dennis Dunaway, and Bob Ezrin as the writers. Uh, right away, you can tell it's a Dennis Dunaway song. It partially because of the lyrical content and partially because of the way the bass is <laughs> right off the bat, the music, the way the bass is played. You always know when it's Dennis done away. And Dennis has this great way of working with Alice to create these songs that always have this great, dirty, gnarly kind of feel to them. And Drunken in Love is just so... Just to start off the song, the, to give you the vibe of it, okay? I saw you, baby, and I pissed my pants. Now I'm shaking while I'm trying to stand. Come into my cardboard box and out of the storm. You can mend my socks while I keep you warm. Falling in love, falling in love. Who'd have thunk I'd be drunk as a skunk and falling in love? It's just dirty gritty Detroit music, man. It really is. And not to say that Detroit is that dirty and gritty, you know. I, I hear that stuff, I think, more in New York than I do Detroit. And I grew up right next to Detroit, you know. Like, literally grew up next to Detroit, okay, folks? I know more about Detroit than, you know, I guarantee a lot of the rest of the U.S. does. <laughs> not the point. Anyways, great tune. So much fun. After that, we go into Independence Dave. Independence Dave, I'm not, I honestly thought this was a cover. I swear I would have, I had heard Independence Dave somewhere before. I want to say maybe, I want to say Ryan Roxy somewhere, on a Ryan Roxy album, I thought I had heard it, but I wanted to check and know. Uh, great tune. This is such a good tune. I really wish I knew where I had heard it before. But it's Alice Cooper, Wayne Kramer, and Bob Ezrin that wrote this. And, it's so much fun, and it's not a serious song. It's just Alice having this great, great time going out of there, singing about this goofy Independence Dave guy, you know? I don't know how to go out other than that, really. Okay, then we get into the song, I Hate You. Alice, Dennis Dunaway, Bob Ezrin. Man, I can't stress how much I love seeing Dennis Dunaway's name on these albums and Neil Smith's name on these albums. It just, that's my Alice Cooper band, man. The original group. These guys, you know, like these are the guys I studied and learned and, and mimicked. And I've covered more of their stuff than anybody else's. But you actually have to read the lyrics in here, okay? Because this is like Alice Cooper therapy here, all right? And it's, uh, Michael Bruce is back on this as well. Uh, Michael Bruce is a performer. And this is like all of them just coming out, getting into each other after all these years. Because there was, at least between certain ones, there's definitely been some animosity over the years and stuff like that. But a lot of this is also a little fun too, because, you know, uh, Neil Smith 
and Dennis Dunaway, um, they're actually in-laws as well. I believe it's, I can't remember which one it is. It's either Neil is married to Michael's, or it's either Neil is married to Dennis's sister or Dennis is married to Neil's sister. I can't remember which one. But, you know, like, you got Neil ripping into Dennis, you know, making fun of him, all these parts about Dennis that he hates. And then you got uh, Michael Bruce, who's ripping into Neil Smith, saying all this shit that he hates about Neil Smith. And then all of them chant, I hate you. And then it goes into uh, Dennis taking all these shots at Alice, you know. And then it goes into Alice taking all these shots at Michael. And then you got all of them again with the I hate you. And then you got all of them to Glenn, as in Glenn Buxton. You know, and I'm going to actually read these ones so much because... Missing Glenn really sucks in a lot of ways. Uh, Glenn's failing health was basically the big division at the end with the band. You know, without Glenn there, it was never quite the same, right? Because the original band started with Alice, Dennis, and Glenn. And then Michael and Neil came in later. Uh, but anyways, uh, so all of them to Glenn... We hate you, we hate your sneer, the cigarettes, the smell of beer, the mutton chops, the switchblade knife, your unapologetic life, but most of all, we're filled with rage at the empty space you left on stage. What a sin. And when you hear that, you're going to probably think like I did at first, that they're talking about Sid as in uh, Sid Vicious from the Sex Pistols. They're not. They're talking about Sid Barrett as him being Floyd. Because these guys were huge, huge, huge friends with Pink Floyd when Sid was still in the band. Monstrous friends. Um, you know, so this was <laughs> This was kind of, you know, them telling each other off, all that therapy over the years, saying goodbye to Glenn. All right. Wonderful World. This song is, I swear to God, is the most beautiful tongue-in-cheek fuck-off to Trump. Ever. It, it doesn't necessarily need to be applied to Trump. It really kind of, I, I could feel a couple other people that it could be applied to. Um, realistically, I feel that it could be applied to Trump, um, uh, in the rock and roll world, it could be applied to Gene Simmons. I don't think it is about Gene Simmons. I think it is honestly about Trump, but let me explain why I think this is about Trump. You cheat and steal every day. You're only human. It's okay. Don't bother with morality. It doesn't sound like fun to me. And if the truth gets in the way, bend it, twist it. That's what I say. I want to get in trouble with you. I want to hit and run with you. I want to be the air you breathe. I want to teach you to deceive. It could be a wonderful world if you could only see. It could be a wonderful world if everyone was just like me. But this song is so bloody funny with the way they do it. And the way it's presented. It is so warm and fun. It's almost as good as our level changes the world. Like it has got that sarcastic tongue in cheek humor in it where it's just like Alice looking at the world and how bad it's gone. Like Alice has said over and over, he's done with the shock rock shtick, you know, going out on stage and doing the show and the performance is one thing, but the trying to shock people anymore. He's done with it. He can't do it anymore. Because if you turn on the TV, everything on TV is just that much more shocking. Okay, moving on. Moving on. And to follow it up, up beautifully, we're moving on to Sister Anne. Sister Anne is written by Fred Smith. I apologize. Oh, no. Wait. I did. I do remember. It's, it's the MC5. This is an MC5 track. And... I really dig this tune. I really like that they did it on here. And I really like that they get into it. And um, depending on how you feel, it, it can be both a good song and a bad song. Uh, I, I like how 
they really get into. Now, I'm assuming Sister Anne was probably a legitimate nun back in the day in Detroit, by the way that they tell this the song is done, the way the story is told. Maybe it wasn't really a Sister Anne, but, you know, like, the way that the story's told in there, I want to believe it was a legitimate person. And this song is a total compliment, you know. It's that whole, someone that, you know, when you're in the... Uh, I just, I don't know where to go with that one, really. It's just, it's a fun tune. It really is. Dig it. Okay. Now... Uh, I'm going to get really, really serious here. Really serious. Um, and the reason I'm going to get really serious here is I go on and on and on and about how much I love Alice and how much Alice means to me. And the reality is, is every time my life has truly, honestly kind of hit the skids, there's always been something Alice there to save me and pick me up and brush me off and keep me going you know and when I was in a really 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 bad place in in my youth really really bad place horribly depressed horribly miserable and whatnot you know you always hear that Alice Cooper saved people and, and he did Alice Cooper saved me you know um the listening to the lyrics the music the 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 artistry even because you know like I'd watched concerts and stuff like that the acting it out the wanting to redo these songs myself and do music videos for them or do concerts or you know perform them my own way and stuff like that that really helped save me in some of my darkest times and in one of my absolute darkest times you know um, when my first marriage dissolved after like fifteen years. Um, coincidentally, it just happened to be right after that, I got to hang out with Alice and Cheryl Cooper and, you know, what could have been a horribly dark time in my life. I was on cloud nine through a huge chunk of it because I went through something so awesome, so excellent, so boom, you know what I'm saying? Um... So that brings me to the next song, Hanging On By A Thread. Alice talks the entire song, except for when singing the choruses. Uh, the song is Alice Cooper, Tommy Hendrickson, and Bob Ezrin. Um, I don't know when these lyrics were written. They could have been written at any time if you listen to the lyrics, because it, 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 they apply really honestly from... 9-11 to now because of how much the world has really truly and honestly changed in 20 years um and the most important part of this song is at the very end you know on the cd you probably can't read it i'm sorry alice puts in here and he says it you know like it's in the lyrics but obviously but he says it on the cd they don't take it off it's not a music video where they put it up at the end or they flash it during the video or anything like that. alice 100 percent on recording permanently recorded now gives the suicide prevention hotline number 1-800-273-8255 back up because right after that we go into shut up and rock okay now um there are a lot of tones on this album i'm gonna be honest that are, people are gonna feel in the lyrics are gonna sound a little misogynistic shut up and rock is one of those songs as well um and it's that whole just like for example uh this is not the opening lyrics i'm just Don't want to hear about your yoga class or how you spent your day. Don't want to hear about your painful past. I don't care anyway about your lips or your perfect tips. Baby, they're A-OK. Just shut up and rock. It's not misogynistic. It's... Baby, just 
Quit your bitching. Quit your complaining. Quit dumping on yourself. Quit this. Quit that. Just love, man. Shut up and rock. Go out there and have a good fucking time, man. Um, and let me tell you, uh, as I have listened to the way that Cheryl talks about Alice without Alice around, and candidly talking about Alice and life with Alice, because, you know, with the time that I've gotten to hang out with her and that, it was very much in an inner circle kind of atmosphere. And I was the outsider that was like so privy to this inner circle. I'm hearing all this stuff. I was like, and, and Cheryl's just talking, you know, family shit. And it's like, you know, Alice is not this dude. Alice loves his wife beyond belief. His wife loves him beyond belief. There, Alice has the utmost respect for women, okay? And this type of stuff on here, when you see this, this is a response to, you know, just the media and stuff like that. So, you know, don't, you can't take it serious. You know, you really can't. Now, we finish off the album with East Side Story. East Side Story is a Bob Seger cover. But it is Bob Seger cover from before the Silver Bullet Band. I had never, ever heard this song before this album. It is a great tune. It is a fun tune. It is not a tune I ever expected from Bob Seger. And I'm going to be very honest with you. After hearing this song, I am going to go out and I am going to find the Bob Seger album that has this on there. And I am going to buy it. Because it is a great friggin' tune. Kind of wish Bob Seger had been there to kind of play on it a little bit. Would have been cool. Um, and I like the fact that he does East Side Story because it goes with the fact that if you know anything about Alice, and if you've ever listened to any other Alice Cooper album in its entirety... You might be familiar with a song called Gutter Cats vs. the Jets, which uses West Side Story and plays with that. Well, East Side Story also plays a little bit off of that as well. Not musically, you know, but elements, lyrical allusions, stuff like that. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. The whole way around, you know, I realize that, you know, you're thinking, well, it's easy to make a top Alice Cooper album when there's like four or five covers on there, blah, 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 blah. The covers don't matter. Alice has released great albums with covers before. The Love It to Death album had a cover on it. Sunrise, great tune. Billion Dollar Babies has a cover on it. Open with the cover. Hello, hooray. It's a cover. Great tune. Alice has never shied from doing covers. I mean, for a while, you know, there's not a lot of them over the years. But he does do them. And when Alice does them, he does them great. You know, Hollywood Vampire's first album was entirely covers, basically, except for two songs. Brilliant album. This is fantastic. Like, there's a reason it came out at number one, you know, and... There's a reason it's been burning up the charts worldwide. I also want to point out, I did buy the deluxe CD version. Uh, the reason I bought the deluxe CD version is it comes with a DVD. DVD is An Evening at the Olympia in Paris. Track listing for the Olympia in Paris. This is a live concert DVD. Unfortunately, it's not CD. That kind of bummer. But... Brutal Planet, No More, Mr. Nice Guy, Under My Wheels, Department of Youth, Pain, as in from the Flush the Fashion album. Wow. Billion Dollar Babies, The World Needs Guts, which he's been pulling out a lot more recently. Woman of Mass Distraction. Wow, I'm impressed that he does that one a little more lately. Poison, Halo of Flies, Feed My Frankenstein, Cold Ethel, Only Women Bleed. Paranoic Personality, which makes sense because it was the album he was touring at the time. Um, and uh, Ballad Dwight Fry, Killer I Love the Dead Themes. Yeah, it's the execution. I'm 18 and School's Out. Really cool assortment of live tracks for a concert. Really fun to watch, too. Um, Get it, folks. If you can get the deluxe edition, the DVD is worth the watch. You know, it's only a few bucks, really, extra for the DVD, so why not? 
buy the album. Buy it, buy it, buy it, buy it, buy it, buy it. This has been a super long review because this has been a super good album and it is super worth listening to. Alice is now and always will be my hero and it's because 50 years. 50 years! Okay? First two albums, we're going to leave out. We're going to leave out Easy Action and, and Pretties for You, okay? We're going to leave those two out. 50 years from when Love It to Death was released. When they were a Detroit band. Now, Love It to Death was recorded in Detroit. This was not or Love It to Death was recorded in Toronto. Very much a Detroit album. This also was not recorded in Detroit. No one records in Detroit, unfortunately, unless you're Motown or Funk. Just the way it goes, unfortunately. But this is a Detroit album, baby. Oh my God. Like 50 years later, just as magnificent as when he first came out on major label with Warner Brothers. Anyways, my name is Christian Eschbach, and peace, love, take care. Hit the subscribe button for notifications. Please leave a comment. And until next time.